Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. Tonight we are in conversation with Dr. Moeed Yusuf. Dr. Yusuf is Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on National Security and Strategic Policy Planning. Uh, thank you, Moeed, for being on the program. Uh, there are at least four or five issues that I want to, uh, you know, put across to you today. But let's begin with India and, uh, and occupied Kashmir. Now, one of the things that we have seen, and I think it's also been talked about, uh, a few salients uh, on the Indian side as far as the Indian policy is concerned, that there is a display of muscular policy options, there's a willingness to escalate militarily and to test Pakistan's resolve, and perhaps also the nuclear thresholds, and then to deter Pakistan from further escalation in a conflict by framing India's military response as preemption. Uh, I've also used the language pretty deftly, uh, saying, you know, we're striking against non-military, non-state actors. And then, of course, the diplomatic offensive to isolate Pakistan and to impose a cost on Pakistan. Uh, they've also changed the status of occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And in order to change the narrative and bring in Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan in any future talk. So um, let's see what, uh, how you look at it and uh, what are the options we have. Look, first of all, let me just say that we are dealing with an eastern neighbor that is now beyond doubt a habitual sponsor of state terrorism. Uh, I think I, I want to register this again and again because, you know, for too long, I think the conversation has been misconstrued, especially in the West, as one country talking about a democracy and secular and this and that and painting Pakistan with the wrong brush. Uh, and what we are finding now is, is again and again, again and again, we've been saying this for years, but unflinching evidence that India is trying to undermine and subvert Pakistan in every possible way it can. And yes, you're right, killing innocent civilians and as of yesterday, as you saw, targeting the pillars of Pakistan's economy. So the world must understand what we are dealing with here. This is not two adversarial countries, um, you know, who are going after each other. This is one country that created an image for itself of being very tolerant and Bollywood and secular and whatever, who in the last month has had a serious embarrassment at the hands of one bigger neighbor. A smaller neighbor has taken them on, put out a map which shows the real old historical geography. No response from India possible. This is a country that dealt with Pakistan last year and you remember what happened at Balakot. This is a country that told the world, not Pakistan, but the world publicly before the 5th of August 2019, that we are moving thousands of troops into illegally occupied Kashmir because we fear a terrorist incident. And the world saw what the terrorist incident was on the 5th of August. And this is a country that is actively changing the demography of a internationally recognized disputed territory. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, it's a long answer to establish that I do not want the narrative to go back to talking about, oh, this is India, Pakistan, adversarial countries have issues, one has one view, the other, no views. The UN Secretary General said, I want truce in every conflict zone, at least during the COVID pandemic. Pakistan said immediately go back to truce. We want the 2003 ceasefire to be implemented in earnest. The other side increased their violations. The 1,400 odd violations just this year. Um, you know, so this conversation has to change and the world has to be shown the face of an intolerant, fascist, expansionist regime. Every single neighbor of India is either fighting or bothered or complaining. 
So forget Pakistan. Is everybody in the region crazy and only India is making sense? That's not possible. Okay. So I, I want to establish this fact very clearly, please. No, I, I'm happy you did. Uh, and, and you know that uh, these are issues that we have, you and I uh, have spoken about over the years many times. And, and I believe that narrative is very important. And this term terrorism itself needs to, uh, to be uh, put in the right perspective. But here's the thing. All of this is fine. But this is about neorealism. This is about interstate relations where states uh, are not really equal, frankly, where uh, one state, as you said yourself, uh, India is facing that kind of thing from China, whereas it is dealing in a completely different way with Nepal. It deals with a completely different way with Pakistan. So all of this, uh, the state sponsor terrorism, uh, what exactly, how exactly are we going to sell it to the outside world? Because the issue is not for you and me to talk about uh, this thing here. It's about product positioning and telling the rest of the world what exactly India is doing. So how successful are we in achieving that? You know, one of the things, one of the weaknesses, I would say, um, in this entire uh, sort of conversation is that Pakistan focused too much on, uh, we, we talked about the ground situation, we tried to present what reality was in Kashmir, and I'm talking over the years. But in the perception space, in the narrative space, unfortunately, um, the success was limited. And, and somehow, and that's not because of what uh, one country or the other did, it was because of the war on terror and 9-11. There's a different mood about Pakistan in the capitals that make uh, global perceptions and create global perceptions. So that's one thing that has to be clarified. I was talking to a a uh, group of journalists some um, days back, and one of the things I told them when they asked me is, what do you want? I said, the world needs to update their software on the narrative on India versus Pakistan. The divergent trajectories of the two countries, where the Pakistani leadership talks about minorities, talks about accountability, talks about open spaces, and another country where not only Muslims, but every minority is being treated subhumanly, where you've got a Kashmir, an open jail for nearly a year now, uh, where the Geneva Convention is being violated, etc. Our policy, yeah, since August 5th, there are only two things we have said to the world again and again. One, human rights. Treat Kashmiris as humans and force India to do that. Second, international law. Whether it's UN resolutions, whether it's bilateral arrangements, whatever it is, follow international law in letter and spirit. And we are not the ones who, you know, people say time is on India's side, absolutely not. If anybody believes that what India is doing in occupied, illegally occupied Kashmir is tenable, is sustainable, and the Kashmiris will just lie low and look the other way, it is simply an impossibility. That's not the character of Kashmir or the people of Kashmir. The other thing to keep in mind is... No, but let me, let me interject. Let me interject. Wait, let me interject here. Kashmiris have shown their resolve, uh, not just post-1947, but even before that, uh, when it was under the Dogra Raja. But... Look at the, the number of troops India has. Uh, look at the statistics. Uh, there are teenage boys that are picking up guns in South Kashmir. They have a very short lifespan. They are not trained. The world is not concerned really about what's happening there. The feeble voices that are raised, they talk about India restoring human rights to Kashmir not really going to the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is that the Kashmiris don't want to be under Indian occupation. And that is the point that so far we have not been able to sell to the rest of the world. And I'm not sure how long it's going to take before we can actually do that. In the meantime, these Kashmiri boys 
will continue to be martyred by the occupation forces? So, first of all, you know, nobody knows how long it's going to take. Unfortunately, uh, there's no overnight uh, respite or solution. But what you said is very instructive. This Kashmiri movement is a movement of the average youth of Kashmir. Long lifespan, short lifespan, not everybody's picking up a gun. This is all of Kashmir's youth. And let me also tell you, there is not a single person in the valley you can find who doesn't hate India to death. If there was any pocket left where there wasn't a complete hatred, that's completely gone. If there is anybody who thinks that you can just get rid of political leadership that's been brought up over generations and put in your cronies and your phonies and start talking about a new leadership, that's crazy. You have an India that is on a suicidal path who's created multiple problems for, for itself. Go and ask what the Ladakhis are saying. Go and ask what the Hindus of Jammu are saying. This union territory facade is not acceptable to anybody in Jammu and Kashmir. The other thing, you may say, and you may have a, a point or a view, that, you know, the world is not waking up. There have been about 800 different articles or actions since August 5th against what is happening in the illegally occupied territory. Yes, not all of them are saying that Kashmir needs to be freed from the clutches of India, but the conversation is status quo in Kashmir is not acceptable. And that is exactly the first step to the final step, which is that Kashmir simply does does not want to be associated with India. So it's a long battle, it's a long drawn out um, effort. Yes, there's no overnight solution, but please keep in mind that you've got to see this situation as the beginning of the end for the Modi regime in terms of what they're planning to do or what they thought they could do in India. And also, this is vindication of every single thing Pakistan said. Terrorism used as a bogey, we said that after demographic change, you're seeing that manifestation. We said that they're going to subvert, they are subverting, they are doing things in Pakistan regularly. Now the world has begun to believe. Yesterday's event, you will see in a few days how clearly it will manifest who was behind it, whose territory they used, who came and did what they did, and how they were unsuccessful. Well, as far as the BLR is concerned, I think it's very clear, even from their own statements, uh, the statements that they issued after the attack, and even the statements that they've issued before the attack. But on that point, let me circle back to this terrorism thing that you talked about earlier also. Look, uh, I can actually give you a number of statements where successive Pakistani leaders and governments have actually fallen into India's trap and used the term terrorism in a very loose fashion. Now, there are, to date, UN General Assembly resolutions, existing resolutions, that talk about two very basic facts. One is that people under occupation have the right to resist, including armed resistance, and even more importantly, that in doing that, they also have the right to call upon external help. Now, if we want to change the narrative, would you agree that it's extremely important for us to shape it not in terms of, yes, we are supporting them politically, diplomatically, the rest of it, but for the Kashmiris, the use of force is not off the table, external help, is not off the table. That, to me, and I may be wrong, because I'm not in the government and there's so many things I'm not privy to, but as a watcher of this, I believe that I think it is time that we change the narrative fundamentally. Two things. First of all, 
is only one form of terrorism just one and you saw that yesterday correct it's perpetrated by a state inside pakistani territory second uh if anybody has talked about kashmir indian occupied kashmir and terrorism that simply doesn't hold under international law it's as simple as that i mean i'm not saying it you can just go i mean you you said it yourself look i've explained this to people anywhere in the world when you go against human nature you will lose whether that's climate whether that's human beings whether that's a war or whatever what is happening in kashmir for the past almost a year now no human being can tolerate that for much longer and if, if you think that the fear of security forces that go into homes and shoot and kill women and children will silence human nature that's not going to happen you know not for a second look pakistan stands for peace everywhere in the region all conflict even the india china one there should be no conflict but don't look at pakistan when you treat humans as animals and they react i mean you have a protest you have violence and you look at pakistan that bogey is not going to work anymore let me also tell you ijaz there is one country that defies geneva convention article 59 doesn't even allow medical supplies to go in during covid in illegally occupied kashmir there's a country that boasts that it has the most hardened border on the yellow sea and nobody can enter and blah blah and then like a coward gets up every time anything goes wrong inside illegally occupied kashmir or india and says oh pakistan look at pakistan we have told the un we have told western missions come with us to ajk see what you want to see this bogey is not going to work anymore we are being fully transparent we are calling a spade a spade and we are reminding everybody that you are dealing with an indian government that is expansionist that is isolated that is frustrated and in its frustration it can and may do something absolutely crazy if that crazy thing is pointed to pakistan don't come back and ask us when we respond so the this is playing with fire neither can kashmir be resolved this way no or do should anybody think that pa pakistan is going to look the other way there's only one way to resolve this issue go back pre august 5th go to that point and sit down and talk like human beings do if you don't have that capacity you want to commit suicide good luck to you okay all right i'm going to take a short break uh, but return to continue this conversation the other areas that i want to discuss with uh, dr yusuf stay with us Welcome back to In Focus. We are in conversation with Dr. Moeed Yusuf, Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on National Security and Strategic Policy Planning. Uh, Moeed, I'm going to return to India when we talk about the region. But for now, let's move to Afghanistan. Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad has been here pretty often, and he seemed quite happy. Even Alice Wells, before leaving office, praised Pakistan's role. What exactly have we done, and what exactly are we doing? that's what we've done is facilitate more than we were asked or expected to nudge all parties to start the intra afghan dialogue asap in a nutshell without pakistan's help and without quite frankly pakistan going out of its way uh, everybody acknowledges unfortunately not every time in public but at least in private that pakistan's role was invaluable to getting all factions to the point where you could start the intra afghan dialogue in earnest 
So hold on. Now, let, 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 hold on. Let me ask specifically. So we're talking about a facilitation uh, uh, with with the U.S. like the Taliban U.S. talks uh, through that process, and then post that process, uh, you know, the prisoner release issue, the pressure on the Taliban themselves, reduction in violence. Uh, I just want to get some specifics here. Look, all of the above in the way that our point throughout has been, nobody can use force to get all sides on the table in a way that you can resolve this problem, right? So every time there was a um, indication or a temptation on any side to essentially unleash, um, you know, use of force in a way or break the shackles, so to, so to say, our role was restraint, facilitation of conversations in rooms and pushing everybody to make it a genuine Afghan-led negotiation. We are literally on the verge of it now. We would have hoped it would have started already. It hasn't, but literally it's now about just crossing the T's. You know, there are some issues left, but everybody acknowledges that without Pakistan, this wouldn't have happened. And the other important point I want to put on the table. In the next phase, the only way for this to be successful is for Afghans to settle this themselves, for nobody to pick favorites, and most importantly, nobody should consider that any regional country like Pakistan is a guarantor of peace. It's now up to the Afghans. They want what kind of republic, who should lead, who should be second, <clears throat> second, who should get what, really up to them. We have no, no, none whatsoever preferences. Fra frankly, Moeed, but frankly, that, that's very optimistic. To, that, that's very optimistic going by the historical trajectory. Uh, but two other things have happened. I mean, uh, obviously, the spoilers, but there was the New York Times report that is now hogging space in the US media, which uh, talked about uh, the fact that, uh, well, not the fact, but which claimed that the Russian GRU uh, was uh, actually giving money to uh, Taliban to kill US and British soldiers. And the NYT story also said that uh, President um, uh, Trump and uh, Vice President uh, Mike Pence were both briefed. Uh, White House denies that. But nonetheless, uh, that is something which is now, as I said, is taking up a lot of space and conversation. Also, um, uh, Secretary, Secretary Pompeo spoke yesterday with Mullah Brother, uh, and uh, the State Department has also uh, put out, uh, uh, you know, uh, a transcript of that conversation. And it says the Secretary made clear the expectations for the Taliban to live up to their commitments, which include not attacking Americans. So I'm assuming that this was with reference to the report that has come out, which the Taliban, by the way, have rejected. And of course, the Russian foreign ministry has also rejected. Uh, I have no information on that, not privy to it at all. And of course, I wasn't um, you know, in government uh, at the time this or whatever this conversation or, or whatever this insinuation is, I, I'm not aware at all. But look, the reason I, I know you said it's optimistic and, and, and perhaps you're right when you look at history. The point I want to make is we don't want a situation where after all this hard work, a small king here or there does not allow this intra afghan process to start. And we are certainly not going to be in a position where if, God forbid, this doesn't move forward, things go wrong, you don't get to the right kind of solution, anybody points a finger and says, oh, Pakistan didn't do enough. That's the point I want to make clear. Our role was in this phase. We have done what we could, actually more than we were asked to do, at personal risk and cost. Now, Afghans have to go forward, and the region and the world has to support them. And the and the capitals really and the and the cap are and the capitals are very clear, including Washington. They're very clear on this. I'm assuming, but I'm just uh, quickly pacing this now because I won't cover uh, other aspects also. Um, but before I move on to the regional situation, one other thing uh, with reference to Afghanistan: uh, the Afghan soil being used to mount attacks uh, inside Pakistan, 
um, in the in the erstwhile fairly administered tribal areas also and in Balochistan also and of course uh, we saw this in Karachi also. So are we having that conversation with them? Look, we'll have a conversation with everybody because we've ne got nothing to hide. We're going to be candid. There is a understanding that nobody's territory should be used against anybody else in the region. There is one country that is repeatedly doing that. We have evidence. We've talked about it. We've shared it. We will continue to do that, but with more focus, more insistence, because it just look, at the end of the day, it is not going to happen this way that India continues its policy in the region as it is. And I'll also tell you, it's going to be very difficult for them to stop because it's an ideologically motivated leadership that espouses expansionism as a core value. So they're going to keep making mistakes. They're going to keep digging a hole for themselves. But the global view has to be updated to know that they're dealing with a most dangerous leadership and country at the moment that can destroy peace in the entire region and beyond. And let me also say, you said you're going to come to the region. I'm assuming it's going to be um, China and other stuff. Let me just say this. For those who have thought of India and dreamt of India as a counterweight to China, this India, mark my words, over the next two years will not even be able to sustain itself the way it's going. Forget about counterweight against anybody else. It's a counterweight against itself. So for those who dream that this is going to go in a different direction, they need to wake up. This is a dangerous country causing destabilization and peace to be undermined in the region. Let's get to uh, the regional situation. Are you right? I was talking about, I was going to start with Sino-India standoff. Uh, so quick uh, question. Uh, 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 obviously, we must be watching it very closely, but are we talking about this with Beijing? Uh, but quickly, responding to that, then we'll go to Iran and the Gulf states and, and Saudi Arabia. Look, as I mentioned earlier, no conflict in the region is good for anybody, including Pakistan. We stand for peace, even with India. Despite everything we've constantly said, if the other side can be rational rather than ideological, go back to pre-August 5th, things can open up. So no conflict is good. On China, I'll just make one simple point without getting into any details. When you see a country on your border that is visibly manifesting threat and expansionism, the other countries cannot be expected to wait till they are hurt to respond. A country that is infinitely smaller or weaker than India in terms of power, let's say Nepal, um, will react the way Nepal did, very rationally. When a country like China or Pakistan looks at that, don't expect us to be waiting, waiting and saying, OK, now I'm hurt, somebody's killed, something's happened. Of course, if I'm seeing an expansionist country trying to undermine my sovereignty or hurt my people, military, civilians. I'm going to do what it takes to kick out a thief of your house. Simple as that. A robber enters my house, I will take care of it as I'm supposed to take care of it. So, you know, now these um, sort of big, big tears flowing down the cheeks of saying, oh, look, somebody did this. Why was it done? It was done because you are showing expansionist tendencies and nobody is going to tolerate it. And of course, wherever my interests align with somebody else's, who's also threatened, you're naturally asking me to respond whenever I can. So I will, and somebody else will, and that's exactly what's happened. And it serves you right if you're not going to play by the rules. OK. Now, we have seen, I think, uh, our diplomacy to that extent has worked well that despite many fissures within the Muslim bloc, we've managed to get the OIC and the OIC contact group and the human rights body of the OIC to issue uh, some very strong statements uh, against Indian uh, oppression in occupied and illegally occupied and in ex-Kashmir. Now, uh, give me a sense of relations, uh, you know, in the sense that you've got Iran, then you've got 
to deal with the Gulf states, uh, including Saudi Arabia. Then there is uh, Malaysia and Indonesia and ASEAN. Um, the Prime Minister Imran Khan had developed very close relations with the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, Mahathir Mohamad. But now you have Mohyuddin uh, Yassin there as the new Prime Minister. So are we structurally good as far as those relations are concerned? Just give me a quick overview of uh, the kind of minefield we have to negotiate uh, given these various divisions when we're dealing with the Muslim bloc. Sorry, before that, on the lighter note, I just uh, <laughs> thought I should mention, uh, we've talked about India and China and Pakistan. Uh, one thing that I remain in awe of is um, you have a crisis with Pakistan, you have mud on your face, and you go and lie to your people win an election. Now you've gone after China, you have mud on your face, and if you look at Indian media these days, uh, soon enough it will be declared a victory. Uh, I wish... Oh, they they already, by the way, they already have. Now they call it, uh, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, but it's called the digital strategic strike against China. Yeah. yeah, they can come up with a lot of names. The only thing I was saying in a lighter way is, and here is the Pakistani media, whenever we give you the truth, we still have to beg and plead to get it out. Not you, but a lot of your colleagues. Anyways, um, the, on, the, on the OIC front, look, I think it's just the world is in flux now. Uh, COVID is sort of the, you know, uh, in some ways a great equalizer, in other ways it's changed the norms and God knows for how long. We are positioned and we will continue to be positioned as perhaps the only Muslim country, very unfortunately, very unfortunately, perhaps the only Muslim country that can talk, talk to all other Muslim countries as real friends. And so, you know, uh, we have very deep ties with the Gulf. We continue to have very deep and good ties with the Gulf. Uh, we have good ties with the countries who are not in the Gulf. And as the Prime Minister has repeatedly said, uh, we remain in a position where our goal is to unite the Muslim uh, Ummah and the Muslim bloc and, uh, you know. And so that's the, the policy. I completely accept if you you say that this is very difficult, there are fissures, that absolutely, I, I accept that. It's unfortunate, but we've got to overcome that. Because if we don't, what we are be beginning to see very clearly is the world is turning nationalistic. Uh, America is going to be looking inward. Uh, the European Union, you've seen, of course, already uh, with the UK. And so if the Muslim bloc is divided from within, I think we're not going to be able to have uh, the kind of benefits of the great equalizer that COVID may have been uh, in terms of the developed versus developing world. Okay. Uh, right. I understand that and I, I, I perfectly appreciate uh, the fact that it's extremely difficult to balance all these very um, different and differing and contradictory and conflicting uh, interests. But um, I know you've been talking about, for a long time, about non-traditional uh, approach to security. Now, given that, uh, I just want to come home for a while before uh, I go back uh, to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, we have another policy challenge, which obviously is the pathogen. And you know there's been much criticism of the government on its rather confused handling of the COVID crisis, not going for the lockdown early enough. And I'm saying this, this is what the detractors say, opening up early and allowing it to peak. You had the Ramazan, Eid, et cetera, uh, opening up. Now, smart lockdowns uh, that aren't particularly smart, and another Eid is approaching. So I just want to hear your view on this. Uh, and we're also going to talk about the stranded Pakistanis. Well, actually, I'm going to throw that question in right now so that you just give me an overview. Of, and now, you're going. To, how, how are you going to bring them back after this PIA crisis? Uh, you've uh, packed in a lot there. Uh, look, first of all, let me just say that a broader point. You started off by saying, let's come back home in terms of the discussion. You know, it is absolutely true, and I want to stress that our basic challenges that we want to focus on as a government, as a country, are internal. And that's why we keep telling the world again and again, we have so much capacity, right? I mean, we have the same security forces manning the western border, eastern border, 
doing COVID duties. We have the same civilian administration looking after everything. That's why we keep saying, help us keep our Western and Eastern border quiet so that we can focus internally. Because I'll tell you honestly, Jaz, the focus is internal, is economy, is social welfare. This part I can categorically tell you, but it's also true. We haven't had that luxury over the last few months uh, or even a year or whatever, unfortunately. That's why it's so crucial for the borders to be silent and that's why we stand for peace, but peace in a respectable and even-handed manner, not in the way that uh, some neighbors may want. On COVID, first of all, let's be honest, nobody in the world knew or knows what that magic formula is, whereby you can do this seamlessly. That's just the, the, the animal you're dealing with. Second, I think as you've got to understand, there were two very stark views on how to handle the, the, the uh, pathogen or the, the COVID crisis. One view, very sharp view, lock down everything, get people to so, uh, distance socially per force so that this doesn't spread. These were the people like me and you who can sit at home, for, sit at home for six months, will not starve, will be okay. Oh we'll no, no, I can't. Movies. I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm in my studio. I have to get out and do my program. So no, I can't sit at home. Let me, let me repeat. These were pe people like you and me who can sit at home for six months, not starve, not feel that this is the end of the world, and get on with it afterwards. Of course, everybody would hurt, but what I'm talking about is the upper middle class, the elite, who thought, that's it, this is the only way to solve it, because they could afford it. Then you had 90% of the population who genuinely, we, we were seeing data, it's not made up, who could not last even another week or 10 days beyond what we kept as a lockdown. People were defying it, they were coming out, they were no longer going to listen to it. So these were two stark views. You couldn't have won both sides. The answer that the entire world has come to is smart lockdown. Now, here is where you can say, well, actually, SOPs are not followed. It's not that smart. And there, of course, there is room for improvement. Everybody's learning as we go. I will also say somewhat um, uh, with, with due apologies, I don't think we got the response from the society on the SOPs as, you know, one would have hoped in terms of wearing masks, in terms of industries being managed. And right, yes, right. everybody says, why don't you enforce? But you know that you don't deal with pathogens or crises that are pandemics by filling up jails. That's okay, not I, I'm, not going, to, I'm so, not going to follow up uh, this uh, because I have my view. But since I'm uh, running out of time, uh, one last uh, question with reference to the stranded, uh, stranded Pakistanis, and I said, about the PIA crisis. I mean, this airline cannot fly now to a number of, uh, you know, uh, regions in the world. Uh, look, you know that we worked on this day and night. I personally have, all of my colleagues have. And thankfully, uh, despite all the complications, you have to understand about half or more than half, I think actually close to two thirds of the world is still closed. It's restricted. Um, in terms of travel and everything. So we've brought over, I think, 120, close to 120,000 people back. Majority labor, that was our focus. Here too, Ijaz, there is elite capture because the people with the loudest voice and the most connected WhatsApp are people who could actually, you know, did not have much of a problem, to be very honest. But yes, this has now gotten more complicated for two reasons. One, of course, the PIA crisis. And second, because very unfairly, we got people back in thousands from the world, no testing from where they were coming. We were testing everybody, making sure everybody was safe and healthy. Now, when we've done our bit, the world has suddenly become holier than thou and is asking Pakistan and some other countries, oh, we're not going to get anybody from your country unless they're fully tested and certified and whatever. So after bearing the brunt of the entire world, now suddenly we've become the victims of you know, others were saying, sorry, 10 Pakistanis came over positive, we're not going to let people come. If we operated in this manner before, there would be nobody coming into the country. So we're dealing with it. It's difficult. We know choices are limited. Let me just honestly tell you two things. 
no labor that wishes to come back will be left abroad two weeks from now. That is our number one priority. Then there are students. Within four to six weeks, this problem will be over. The problem we will have remaining is outbound passengers because the world is changing its rules every day and we'll have to cater to that. And PIE, of course, unfortunately, seems like we'll not be able to go to much of the world for some time. So that is going to be complicated. But most of our people who are going abroad, I would request them not to travel because they're discretionary travelers. Please okay. don't go. Just stay where you are because we can't guarantee you that three weeks from now, we will be able to bring people back depending on how the pathogen is, is uh, behaving. So, you know, please only travel if it's necessary to travel. But I want to promise you it's very difficult for everybody. We know we've been working on this day and night. It's not neat. It's complicated. But everybody is doing this and the PM is watching this every single day. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Moeed. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. You're talking to Dr. Moeed Yusuf, Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on National Security and Strategic Policy Planning. This is all from In Focus this week. We shall see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.